we are on page 95 of Mises' book, a section called Law and Society, the Development of Laugh Crit. Now, I guess I would say that a couple years ago, or a few years ago, when this book was published, or when Mises was writing this book, very few people in the world had heard of this thing called critical race theory, which is what Mises begins discussion here of, because what he is talking about is how Lat crit or Latino Latino critical legal theory developed in relationship to this other thing known as critical race theory. Now, as I said about when Mises was writing this book, nobody had heard of critical race theory. And that's why it's probably in the middle of the book on page 95, way deep in there and very difficult to understand. But if you open your Yahoo News or your Google browser or just browse politics or happen to turn on a television show these days about politics, all of a sudden, all these people are, this was from a few days ago, School board candidates who opposed critical race theory win. So there have been school board meetings and politicians and denouncing this critical race theory, which to me, I couldn't understand it. I still don't quite understand it. I'm excited that Mize wrote about it because maybe it gives us a chance to figure out what the heck is going on out there. Because I guarantee you, that three years ago, when Mize wrote this book, and when critical race theory had already come out, it was already around, but I guarantee you that 90%, maybe 95% of our college professors had no idea what critical race theory was. And I guarantee you that 100% of elementary and public school teachers had any idea what critical race theory is. The only reason anybody is talking about critical race theory is because they heard it on some weird political broadcast. So it's very strange that all of a sudden everybody's banning it and making laws and talking about how it's taught in schools when nobody knows what it was or is actually because they still don't know what it is. So I am glad, I'm glad that we're doing a little of Mize on this because it's so you know, I mean, it's so naive now. Mize is just writing this stuff. We can't understand it because, you know, it's, it's some pretty heady stuff. Because critical race theory comes out of law schools, like not even colleges. Like that place that you go after college where you want to become a lawyer. It comes out of professors of law and people who were doing legal scholarship who had like even more advanced degrees in law school and the people who were teaching the lawyers to be. Anybody who wants to go to law school here? Marco, good. I really recommend it. How are you gonna get there? What should you take here? Political science is a great place to start. And in fact, I think the political science department houses the pre-law program, which will be a good thing to get you there. Good. Yes, we need more good lawyers. We really do. So I'm glad. Anyway, critical race theory came out of a particular perspective in law schools. Like I said, the level past where we are and advanced legal studies. Now, why would it take place there? In part, and we'll see a couple books are mentioned here by Ian Haney Lopez which uh, Mize discusses in this section a couple times. Uh, this is his book, White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race. So one of the reasons that critical race theory emerges in law schools is because of how bound up in the United States race is with the law and how many laws have been made about classifying people and where on the racial line they should be. Now, in many other countries, even in countries that have, you know, some very serious race attitudes, people who maybe grew up in Latin America or the Caribbean, or 
In many other countries, this is not such a big deal. Race is not so bound up with the law and these legal definitions. Um, there are, of course, places where it is, but the United States is, I don't wanna say we're unique, but we are particularly very interested in legally defining who is black and who is white. And that has to do, as, as Mize says here, with a history of classifying people because being classified as white or black meant being free or not free or having certain rights or not having certain rights. It meant being able to go to certain schools or not go to certain schools, go to certain uh, places or not be able to travel. So it's had a legal definition. And in the United States, we have generally in the law followed what the anthropologists call hypodescent, which is the idea that if you are the offspring of a black white union, that you are classified as, well, the, the non-dominant race. And so if you have any degree of what we call admixture or race mixtures, all the people in those categories are going to be classified as black. And so this was actually codified. Uh, it's not just a social idea. Now, by the way, other people don't do this in other parts of the world. Some people do different kinds of of mixtures and consider people to be, we've talked about this, consider people to be mestizo or mulatto or some sort of mixed category that actually you can identify as. But in the United States, you have to be one or the other. You have to be on either side of this binary. As we've talked about, it's only in the last, uh, it was only since 2000 that on the census, you were allowed to mark off more than one box. And that's increasingly happening. But from a legal standpoint, it's still iffy if you're, you actually get to be legally classified as anything but by, uh, by hypo descent. And so many states codified this into laws. So some states had a one quarter law. So if any of your grandparents, if one of your grandparents had African ancestry or were black, you were classified as black. Other states had a one eighth law. Any of your great grandparents, other states had a 116th law, any of your great great grandparents. And the most extreme case is the one drop rule, which is any African ancestry at all, and then you become black by law. So uh, Ian Haney Lopez here is writing about the ways in which race has been entangled with the legal system to a degree that is. Uh, is, is truly profound in US history. And so the main contention of critical race theory, the main idea that they, uh, that they were purporting, and again, this is from legal school and legal, law school and legal scholars, is that racism is central to US law. But even when people were supposedly writing race neutral laws, laws that don't look like race, that there's often been either, often it's just been an explicit history of defining race and putting race into the law. But even in times when people have attempted to write so-called race neutral or colorblind laws, that it remains a central part of the US legal system. And so this is kind of how uh, critical race theory developed as a response to these, uh, these legal issues. Now, Latcrit, what a cool name, Latcrit, I love it. It sounds a little bit like Litcrit though, but Latcrit or Latina, Latino critical legal theory is what Mize mostly wants to discuss here, um, but he needed to talk about uh, critical race theory because it's very related to it. It's part of the same, uh, it, you know, they were interacting uh, with each other and it was building upon critical race theory. However, uh, Mize notes that when lat crit emerges, they are trying to avoid the past mistakes of critical race theory, which is, I guess, interesting to me because 
in some ways, not only in the academy, but among the professors who were talking about critical race theory, they had already thought about it as, okay, well, that's not exactly right either, and there are some mistakes there. Now, Mize doesn't actually detail what the mistakes are, uh, but I think it has to do with the idea that critical race theory really emerged because it emerged so much as a black-white issue that it wasn't adequate for describing the kinds of uh, identifications with Hispanic, Latino, Latino populations in the United States. That it was too, in some ways, US-centric and that it took this black-white binary as a given and couldn't address these other issues. Nevertheless, as, uh, as Latcret or La Latino Latino critical legal theory emerged, it was almost exclusively in law schools and legal theory. Those were the people who were doing it. Those are the people who came to the conferences. Now, Mai says that in more recent times, uh, people who are in the education field, scholars of education have also joined in with some of these conferences. So people who are teaching uh, who, who are professors in education departments. And the reason, or one of the main reasons why uh, people are trying to, uh, this, this is a kind of natural alliance, is to try to understand why it is that there are so many leaks in the pipeline if you are a Latina or a Latino student, and why it is so difficult. See, that's why we need Marco there. On page 98, uh, there is a one in 100 chance of a Mexican American earning a terminal degree, PhD, MD, JD. Not saying anything about your ethnicity, Marco. I'm just saying it's, you know, that's been hard, right? Because there are these leaks in the pipeline at every stage. People drop out. They drop out for various reasons, right? And that's a huge problem if that's what you're going for. The JD, the PhD, the MD, that terminal degree. So PhDs are people like me, doctorate in something or other. MDs are medical doctors, JDs, that's your law degree, right? And that's what you want. You want that terminal degree so you can, you know, be out there doing stuff. Other kinds of degrees are good too, but those are, you know, there's a way out there. Uh, so there are major leaks in the pipeline. The problem is that people at various stages from elementary school through the university system uh, for various reasons get, uh, get held up or are forced to do other things. And one of the things that they, the, uh, the Latcrit scholars were focusing on is uh, on page 99, the role of microaggressions, right? And this is something that, this is actually probably the, the question on the quiz that tripped up the most people. So microaggressions, the subtle insults, verbal, nonverbal, and or visual, directed at people of color, often automatically or unconsciously. So the kinds of things that, you, you know, that me as a person, have maybe have some unconscious biases or ideas about things and, and then might direct a subtle insult that kind of accumulates over time and has an effect on a person's feeling of self-worth. I mean, perhaps you could say my example of the uh, Picking on Marco here is an example of that, right? Because I'm just assuming that you're part of this perhaps leaky pipeline. So we'll try not to do that, right? We don't want to assume anybody is anything, right? We want to be able to meet people where they are and try to figure out how to, you know, keep people on track, on track to where they want to be. All right. So, you know, these microaggressions are difficult because, you know, a lot of them, as I say, they come out subconsciously or automatically. And, but there are ways to try and, and you can take the, uh, the implicit bias tests and think about, you know, the ways in which uh, people make assumptions of long lines of race, ethnicity, gender, age that assume something about people's worth. Um, you know, we also have to be very concerned with the major aggressions, but these are things that, at least in the educational system, something that we can, we can turn our attention to. 
And in the same way that you could say, or that uh, the, uh, the critical race theory people said that racism was central to US law, you could certainly say that racism has been central to US education, that oftentimes US education doesn't work so much as a credentialing system, as a system that's actually hoping to pe help people along and provide social mobility, that the US education system functions as a, bless you, as a sorting mechanism, right? That keeps the elite in our ivory towers where they are and keeps people who are not elite, uh, not out of the uh, out from getting those terminal degrees and out from getting those really uh, great paying jobs and all the things that we're supposed to get from flight path. So you could say here that in fact, uh, the US education system, uh, which is currently uh, as or more segregated than it was back in the 1950s under Brown v. the Board of Education, uh, has has developed this uh, very very nice system of sorting people into categories. Now, before we get depressed about those two things, uh, Maya says here uh, that the uh, there's a there's a side to this which is hopeful, which is that if if racism is central to U.S. law, then there's a the other side to this is hopefulness. It also means that the law can be used to undo racism. That you can use the law to do good things. That's why I'm pushing Marco to get that law degree, right? To using the law to undo racism. And you could also say the same thing perhaps about education. That education might, if racism is central to US education, then we might also be able to use education to undo racism. So there's a hopeful side to both critical race theory and to uh, when it's uh, done in the law and in, the, uh, in education. The hopeful side is that you're trying to, uh, to help people understand these mechanisms in order to modify them or to undo them. So far, this has not really worked out, as we've seen. So far, people have not been undoing it. They've been just banning it. Now, again, nobody was teaching this stuff. And it's very difficult for me to figure out how it is or why it is that there's been a backlash to something that wasn't even going on. Now, I will say that I, all, I do understand if the idea of critical race theory is that race is racism is central to US law and that racism is central to US education, people may get a little bit sensitive about that because they don't want to believe it. However, it's still, you know, I mean, this is not at the level of ideas. I think this is mostly at the level of words, which is the words, I mean, the wonderful thing about critical race theory is they really pick some beautiful words that nobody, whoops, that nobody likes or that people don't like out there, like critical. So in college, we professors like to believe that we are teaching students critical thinking and we think that's a good thing. However, I think out there in the world, a lot of people don't want people learning to be critical or to think or to be critical of anything because it sounds like you might be criticizing them. So, you know, critical is kind of a bad word out there. And of course, race, that's a word that nobody likes to talk about either. So we won't want to talk about that. And then there's the word theory, which, uh, you know, don't want people learning theories, like the theory of evolution. Not good to teach that in school. Why would we want to learn about the theory of evolution? And in fact, as we've seen, or as we see, is that people are able to use these laws, are able to push these issues, not just to you know get rid of, of critical race theory, which was never there from the beginning, but to ban various books and ban various, uh, various ideas 
And so that's one of the reasons why we had that banned book exercise back at the library to talk about, you know, why people have tried to get rid of certain ideas and to not have them taught. Again, this is not something that's happening. It's not something that's actually being taught in schools, but it's a convenient way to get your agenda passed, especially since these words sound so scary, critical race. Theory. Yikes. This is an example. I said that we were going to look at a couple of books uh, by Ian Haney Lopez. This is another one that uh, my cites. This is an example of dog whistle politics. Let me know what a dog whistle does. Haley. It's very high pitch frequency that only dogs can hear. So if I have a dog whistle, I can blow the thing and the dogs perk up, but we're all, we all don't hear it. Some of you know, have you ever done, does any of you have your phone set on like a really high pitch frequency so your professor can't hear it? Do you know that trick? <laughs> It can work with humans too. The older we get, the lower our frequencies can hear. So some students can turn, tune their phones up to the highest frequency levels and then I can't hear it. Ah, see, tricky. Anyway, dog whistle politics. Dog whistle politics refers to the idea that you're using coded messages. So you're saying one thing that sounds completely neutral and completely fine. But for those who are listening in on the other side, it's coded language for various, usually uh, as Haney Lopez has, says here, how coded racial appeals have reinvented racism and wrecked the middle class. And this I think continues to go on. The middle class seems to want to wreck themselves here by banning education and things that might be, might be nice for them to have. Um, but the classic example of a, a coded racial appeal or a dog whistle statement it was the idea of states' rights, that states needed these rights and that it sounded neutral, but it was basically a, a, an appeal to segregation. Um, these days, ever since probably about 2016, People just threw the dog whistles away and started whistling. Like it's not, you know, I mean, it, the, the dog whistle, you don't have to dog whistle anymore. You just say, say real loudly what you think. And people are like, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of gone away. But this, uh, this is somewhat, the idea that, oh, we're going to ban critical race theory. Uh, it sounds again, somewhat neutral, but it's appealing to this whole range of, of those who have their ears perked up for those kinds of things. So, like I said, this is a section on law and society that was relatively buried in, uh, in Mises book. There was no reason necessarily to foreground it. I think if Mises wrote this book today, he'd have a whole other part on what happened here and, and how strange it has been. But at the time, there was no reason to. 